A Peugeot still carries traces of the struggle between work, life, labor, and rust. First, a quote from Hans Pruitt of the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. In anti-Tayloristic team working, there is no supervisor inside the team. The function of spokesperson rotates. All team members can participate in decision making. Standardization is not relentlessly pursued. Management accepts some measure of worker control. There is a tendency to alleviate technical discipline, to find alternatives for the assembly line. Buffers are used. Renumeration is based on proven skill level, and there are no group bonuses. In the current normative discourse on the organization of work, teams are the name of the game. The team concept seems to offer the best of several worlds. It promises control without oppression. Its connotations combine vigor and aggression with warm social relationships. The team concept is the common ground between humanistically driven reform strategies, such as socio-technical systems design, and Japanese-style rationalization. In many cases, team working is treated as an undifferentiated zone. But since it is clear that there is a wide variation between types of teams, this is unsatisfactory. This undifferentiated treatment also leads to policy problems. For example, for unions, especially in the US, the UK, and Australia, unions criticize team structures as being disguised work intensification measures, leading to increased work-related injuries and stress. However, at the same time, no one seems to want to go back to the old Taylorist system. The way out of this dilemma is a differentiating view of team working. One way to obtain such a view is to make use of the distinction between anti-Taylorism and neo-Taylorism. In an art context, ambiguity is displacement and analysis of the location of the struggle over work, life, and labor. It is the critical play that can take place in the space between what we might call anti-Tayloristic and neo-Tayloristic models of operation and reward, and how these affect our reading of what is produced in the world. Ambiguity is not the subject of the work itself in this case. It is an effect that is perceived when an artwork does not merely mirror the dominant culture, but attempts to address the current state of labor and social relations as the subject of art itself. Art must address the conditions under which a sense of contemporary life is produced, rewarded, and operated upon within the context of ever-developing methods of control, analysis, and endless work. The key here is an understanding of how work, life, and labor can be disentangled and understood. This leads away from the didactic and towards the recognition of a tension between different ways of occupying time and does not rely on an analysis of forms and how they might be consumed alone. Ambiguity functions in an art context as a political weapon when it engages in practices that are not limited to the hyper-differentiation of the art context, but looks instead at modes of work and production. A neo-Taylorist approach here is analogous to the notion of the creation of semi-autonomous institutional-like structures as signifiers of soft authority. An acceptance of the development of a recognizable vocabulary to be refined, and the development of a steady trajectory of consolidation and reward. Anti Tayloristic approaches here are analogous to the continual emergence of semi autonomous groupings, a continual consciousness and potential rejection of institutional validation modes, and the development of sustaining work practices that do not rely upon traditional routes of reward and advancement but instead point the trajectory of production in many directions simultaneously, as we have seen today. Ambiguity in the art context is the operation of a critical art practice that functions within an awareness of the tension between the neo-Tayloristic and the anti-Tayloristic. An example, my work over the last five years finds this as its starting point from a text in 2005 written for my exhibition, a short text on the possibility of the creation of an economy of equivalence at the Palais de Tokyo in Paris. We have to think hard about a group of people who are occupying a former place of production that employed new models of work just before it imploded and was absorbed within a much more predatory structure. 
They come back to meet each other and play out the ongoing sway between working in isolation and working in groups in a culture that was supposed to have no crisis. It turns out that they're actually producing something that provided a base level productivity model for the parasitical group, which has finally removed all production from them. In other words, their pioneering working practices were adopted and adjusted primarily for their propaganda value, but the actual changes that were produced have been abandoned in favor of an increasing sense of destabilization and corruption of the social. Their earlier attempts at flexibility have been applied to them as individuals too. They have become a mutable element, part of the production line, elements that are forced to adapt, quit, or evolve whether they like it or not. They are no longer producing objects or things, but they are playing out models of activity that function as a reminder of how things could be. They realize that they are being manipulated and that for a while they have been permitted to survive within a relatively progressive working environment, much longer than their brothers and sisters elsewhere. There is cultural capital in their lingering existence as symbols of what could have been and what will soon be gone. We have to consider the idea of this shuttered place of production quite carefully. This place may well be a new model, or could be a combination of old models. It probably involves some sequence of activities that has been reworked so that it now projects contradictory messages. The bringing together of groups and shattering of them followed by a re repetition of the same ad infinitum, or so it seems to be. The necessity for moments alone is crucial to this ongoing recombination of people, ideas, and systems. Pressures are applied to all the people who work in this place of production to ensure that they require moments of isolation from the group, not in order to become involved in meaningful moments of self-reflection, but just to recover from the weight of contradictory circumstances. This is the origin of the work. This is the apparent ambiguity. It is, in fact, a series of starting points that require a concentration on new models of production in order to understand what is yet to be produced. Thank you.